Imagine a land of perpetual light, where a never-setting sun shines upon beautiful landscapes. Imagine next a land of perpetual darkness, cold and foreboding where nightmares lurk in the black. Both of these are a reality for the plain of Lorwyn Shadowmoor, but how can such contrasting lands cohabitate? Unique among planes in the blind eternities, this is a realm of fused dichotomy. The light and promise of Lorwyn is lashed to the grim despair of Shadowmoor, and each gives way to the other beneath the transformative magic of the Aurora. Within, various creatures struggle for survival and companionship, as their own internal nature shifts with the vagaries of the plane. Lorwyn Shadowmoor is vibrantly colored by the mythology and folklore of the British Isles from which it draws inspiration. The plain's rolling pastures hearken to the idyllic greens of English and Irish countryside. The highlands' peat bogs and the eastern marshes are illustrated in Lorwyn swamps and islands, while the plain's active crust gives birth to rock as indomitable as the Welsh mountains. Within this landscape dwell denizens conjured from Isle myth, especially fey folk. Lorwyn's elves, fairies, and changelings resemble fair races of the forests and moors at times playful, at times cruel, always fickle and mischievous. These races are well documented in both oral tradition and written word. Selkies are the Norse and Celtic seal folk who can transform between seal and humanoid. The Marrow merfolk of Lorwyn are so named from the same creatures of Irish myth. Hookahs, banshees, boggarts, and redcaps all appear in British lore as boogeymen to frighten or scapegoats to blame. The communal kithkin who dwell in defensible clackens have strong ties to family and neighbors. In fact, their name is derived from the old Gaelic and English words kith and kin, which mean one's family or one's countrymen. The kithkin's familial organization and distrust of outsiders is reminiscent of Irish, Scottish clans, allegiances bound in blood whose members would war with rival clans. Both the environment and the races of Lorwyn breathe life into British fable, albeit with their own magical flair. Lorwyn is bucolic and sparsely populated. Filled with beauty, the plain is rarely visited by outsiders, due to its remoteness from interplanar hubs and its reticence to stand out. It fills a void of dream and ether, discovered only by those with an attuned mind. Surprisingly though, it was the first plane where the planeswalker card type was introduced. Lorwyn's denizens, at least prior to the new Phyrexian invasion of the multiverse, were spark-blind, recognizing neither the existence of planeswalkers nor other planes. Also quite unique across the multiverse, Lorwyn supports no humans. Its civilization is filled with sentient races of myth. Lorwyn is small, with dense thickets sporadically broken by open fields or craggy ranges. All known races well within the Blessed Nation, which is ringed by a nearly impassable mountain range. A protean and ethereal landscape called simply the Primal Beyond extends from the mountains to the edge of the plain. Many believe Lorwyn's greater elementals, and even some lesser elementals, are given shape within this seething torrent of emotion, creativity, and thought. Rivers and streams snake across the Blessed Nation, nourishing forest and village alike. But interestingly, Lorwyn is without any major bodies of water. The rivers are instead fed by an underground network of waterways and springs, known as the Dark Meanders. Two sides of not just contrasting aesthetic but conflicting essence struggle over primacy. The Great Aurora, a magical event inherent to the plane, transforms Lorwyn into Shadowmoor, and vice versa. The landscape the wildlife, even the denizens are twisted into their grim counterpart, or liberated into brilliance. Nearly all forget the lives they knew before the aurora passes, and assume the present is all that has existed. It's believed that the great aurora once traveled over Lorwyn Shadowmoor in a more natural and regular cycle, mimicking that of day and night. But long ago, the fey queen Una used powerful magic to extend the time in each cycle to last over 300 years. As such, each passing of the aurora has become a significant planar event. 
Lorwyn represents day in this mystically sustained cycle. It's frozen in perpetual midsummer, where fields are fertile, forests are in eternal spring, and the sun shines on all. The dark fingers of night are forever banished, and winter's chill never seeps into the earth. In fact, the sun never completely sets beneath Lorwyn's western sky. The darkest the plain ever gets are in the pale glow of early morning and the golden hues of evening. Shadowmore is Lorwyn's dark reflection and represents night in the day-night cycle. The Aurora plunges Shadowmore into perpetual gloom, where bitterness, cold, and want have replaced Lorwyn's hope and promise. Daylight is just a dream, summer isn't known. The forest shed leaves and twist into gnarled mazes. Willow the wisps and eerie glows emit the faintest light, warning creatures to stay hidden in safety. Each race and species takes on a persona opposite of that it manifested in Lorwyn. Most turn wicked or cruel, others grow superstitious and fearful. Horrors of the night who remained dormant in Lorwyn's light now stir from their slumber. Terrible hags and spirits haunt moors, demons and nightmares stalk forests, and fallow fields are watched by magically animated scarecrows. Lorwyn's abundance is replaced by Shadowmoor's scarcity, and most beings are locked in a life-or-death struggle to survive. Lorwyn Shadowmoor is inhabited by several races who lay claim to specific regions of the realm. Kinship is integral to Lorwyn, perhaps more so than any other plane, and one's duty to community, tribe, or family forges strong bonds. We see this in the block's tribal spells and kinship mechanic. Nine humanoid and sentient races dwell in their respective locales. The goblin boggarts, the stalwart kithkin, the mischievous fairies, the proud elves, the wise tree folk, the marrow merfolk, the temperamental giants, and the passionate flamekin. Short in stature, but large in heart, Lorwyn's kithkin are a hardier folk than their features suggest. Large, ovular heads hold round eyes and soft faces that give the kithkin an almost childlike look. But to think them so would be a mistake. Though largely agrarian people, all take up arms against perceived threats to their community. The kithkin have a strong connection to white mana, which engenders a sense of unity, purpose, and martial prowess. These are supported by auxiliary values offered by green, blue, and occasionally red to create a robust society that is in tune with nature and occasionally relies on the mystical. The most unique feature of Kithkin is the Thought Weft, an innate subliminal psychological force that unites Kithkin communities through invisible bonds of shared thought and emotion. The Thought Weft can be likened to telepathy but not to such an extent that each kithkin loses individuality or independent thought. It's more so an attuned network that allows kithkin to deeply experience each other's feelings and bind the community. We hear the importance of the thought weft in cards like Wise and Sen, whose flavor text reads, Thought weft binds us together as one, part of an intricate pattern that would unravel if even one thread came loose. And in Gold Meadow Stalwart, the Thought Weft ties a clacken together. Sharing each other's hopes and fears, all the village's citizens spring into action upon the first threat to any one of them. Thought Weft is visually displayed with shimmering halos or glyphs on the foreheads of those engaged in telepathic communication, and Kithkin eyes glowing in eerie, pale white. Communities are organized into small villages called clackens. Thatched roofing tops hovels excavated from rich soil or built into the earth itself. The Clacken is often surrounded by a palisade with guarded gates to prevent incursions by mischievous fae or boggarts. Beyond, large plots of farmland are tilled and springjack grazing pastures are watched by shepherds. A Kithkin elder, known as a Sen, resides as mayor and chief decision maker of a Clacken but each individual's concerns are voiced through uniting thought weft. Many clackens dot Lorwyn's open hills, the likes of Burrington, Ballyrush, Goldmeadow, and the largest of all, Kinsbale. Kithkin existence is a pastoral dream, but when village bells ring out an alarm, 
Mills halt production, smithies grow silent, and crooks are replaced by swords and bows. Each clacken has a militia dedicated to protection, but most all kithkin turn fierce if they feel threatened. Knights ride atop spring jacks and spell dusters fly on manufactured zephyrs. Bowmasters loose sharp arrows protected by dauntless shield airs. Though on cordial terms with most other races, kith can defend against Lorwyn's boggarts and a rampaging giant can render entire clackens to dust. Kithkin are a superstitious folk whose beliefs revolve around veneration of Lorwyn's greater elementals, creatures of myth that are manifestations of primal emotions and foundational essence. All ancestral fables are catalogued for future generations in the Book of Kith and Kin. When the aurora descends upon Lorwyn's fields, the Kithkin are transformed into hypervigilant fear-mongerers, suspicious of outsiders. Their wide-aligned sense of community is taken to the extreme, as heard in the flavor text of Thoughtweft Gambit. The Kithkin mind bond is even tighter in Shadowmoor, reinforcing the unity of their community to the point of xenophobia. Shadowmoor's Kithkin replaced the relative openness of Clackens with the walled-off fortresses known as Downs, whose impregnable parapets are patrolled all hours of eternal night. Symbolically, the names of Lorwyn's Clackens are replaced by dark counterparts. Ballyrush is now known as Ballynock, and Gold Meadow is shrouded in the perpetual fog of Mist Meadow. Trappers and Skulks silently patrol wheat fields infested with boggles, boggarts, and all slinking creatures of the night. Preachers and clerics use Kithkin fear as a weapon to strike at imagined enemies wherever they might lurk, which we see represented in the Arden flavor text of Kithkin Zealot. The more his flock fears, the more power he wields. The sacred Mount Tanafel is a birthplace of Lorwyn's sentient elementals known as Flamekin. It's a tectonically active range suffused with red mana that spontaneously produces this impetuous race. An amalgamation of flame and mutable stone, the Flamekin are filled with red mana's zeal and restlessness. Their souls are stoked by an inner wanderlust that drives each Flamekin across Lorwyn in a journey of self-discovery and actualization called the Path of Flame. It's a spiritual sojourn fraught with danger but unlocks great potential. Masters of the Path are known as soul stokes who fan life's passionate flames in others, which we hear in the flavor text of Kindled Fury, where the soul stoke Alulia states, all beings carry the fire inside them. The challenge is to unleash it before they dwindle into oblivion. Very few flamekin reach the end of their path, a climax that ultimately ends in self-immolation. Like the fire that fuels them, flamekin are fickle. They offer warm companionship or unleash destructive inferno. Many of Lorwyn's other races are weary of their unpredictability, but a traveling group known as the Bright Hearth work to undo this stigma. As the flavor text of Bright Hearth Banneret reads, the banner symbolizes the goodwill of the Bright Hearth. Their emissaries bring the mastery of fire to other races. They act as wandering smiths and energy providers. Many flamekin are shamans that direct inner fire or stoke it in their allies. Others are skilled warriors who wield red-hot blades. Chief among their enemies are Lorwyn's elves who attempt to subjugate and confine the flamekin to their mountain homes, fearful that their fires will burn down the forests. The race's animosity is illustrated in the card Hunt Down and in the art and flavor text of Consuming Bonfire. We see that elves enforce their will through the presence of tree folk. The elves use tree folk to drive us away. It's time to remove their tools. Flamekin view Lorwyn's greater elementals with wonder. As a shared race, they attach a spiritual connection to the fleeting but powerful elementals, and Flamekin believe them to be gods or voices for the plane. When the aurora pulls darkness across Lorwyn, the Flamekin inner fire is doused. All that remains in their cold hearts is smoldering embers, jealous of others for the warmth that is denied them. They are transformed into cinders, an apt name 
for their passion has been stained with cynicism and their desire to spread cheer, replaced by a drive to snuff the light out of others and spread misery. Shadowmoor superstition holds that the cinder's flames were stolen by the traitorous extinguisher. Now gutted and skeletal, they sow destruction in effort to reclaim it. Cinder despair is painfully recounted in the flavor text of Ashen Moor cohort. None will concede a place for us in this world. If it's not for us, neither shall it be for them. We rest not until they choke in its cold ashes. The nomadic band of Bright Hearth is transformed into Night Hearth, cruel cinders that immolate, scar, and sour the land. In Shadowmoor, they have taken on the color black to symbolize the evil they've embraced and the selfishness that now corrodes their soul. Lorwyn is crisscrossed by a network of meandering rivers that water the land and provide travel and commerce for the plains denizens. These aquatic lanes are patrolled by the Marrows, Lorwyn's merfolk race. They occupy the role of merchants, couriers, guides, and diplomats as the Marrows' unparalleled swimming ability allows them to quickly reach even Lorwyn's furthest horizon, and the Marrow Lanes connect the plain like no Overland Trail can. The Wanderwine is the central hub where most, if not all, rivers meet. It teems with merfolk who trade and rest between journeys. Subterranean rivers unite seemingly unconnected routes, and Marrows are uncanny at navigating this underground labyrinth. But there is a place even they seldom tread, the Dark Meanders a maze unknown and devoid of light. As an aquatic species, marrows are attuned to blue mana, and they share in its values of knowledge, foresight, and quick intellect. They plumb depths for hidden or arcane wisdom. Wizards, such as the Aquatex and Tide Shapers, influence the river's course, reinforce banks, or reroute streams. But marrows are also a communal race that values unity and shared purpose which also gives them a firm base in white mana. In fact, Marrow society is organized into groups called schools, in which learned mentors pass down insights to eager students. Regere is the title given to a school's leader, and each school is interested in specific tasks or discoveries. Such schools as the Stony Brook, the Silvergill, and the Ink Fathom exist to name the largest and most common, but many lesser bands of tutor and pupil develop, which we see in the flavor text of Stony Brook Schoolmaster. Marrow schools rarely form by design. They come together naturally as eager learners surround the wisest teachers. After the Aurora passes, Lorwyn's gracious and inquisitive marrows transform into the thieving cutthroats of Shadowmoor. Their figures grow spiky and fish-like, their countenance cruel, they lose the ability to think critically or speak elegantly, and so devolve into a brutish society. Shadowmoor's rivers are no longer a symbol of commerce and travel. The marrow lanes are choked with algae and muddied. No soul dare go beyond the shallows for risk of being drowned. Marrows are driven by avarice and greed. What they don't have, they steal. Wanderwine, the one-time pillar of learning, trade, and beauty, has now become the brackish swamp of the Wanderbrine. The text of Deep Channel Mentor elaborates on the powerless state. The rivers can no longer provide safe passage for travelers and commerce. They serve only as highways for raiders and channels for blood and woe. As with other races, Shadowmoor's merfolk have given up their wide-aligned beliefs and embraced the selfish corruption of black mana a reservoir of which might lie deep in the dark meanders, where the Ink Fathom School dominates. The Marrow's change of heart is heard in the text of Ink Fathom Infiltrator. No one can navigate the dank maze of Shadowmoor's rivers better than the cruel and covetous Marrows. They use the currents to steal and to steal away. Another race of merfolk not found on Lorwyn but native to Shadowmoor are the Selkies. They aren't malicious or aggressive. Instead, their hearts are filled with a longing they can't contain. Bereft of a large body of water, Selkies sing mournful songs of an ocean they've never known. 
Beside murky pools and bubbling mountain tar pits scurry Lorwyn's goblins, known as Boggarts. Boggarts are unique among other goblin races in the multiverse in that they are visually heterogeneous and don't share in many of the common goblin tropes. It can be likened to a sort of catch-all term that describes any short, inquisitive, and reckless creature interested in causing mischief, sowing chaos, and reproducing. Also unlike other planes, Lorwyn's Boggarts have a stronger affiliation with black mana than red, though they do share in many red ideals. Their penchant for black is tied to the carelessness with which they view their own life. Many Boggarts don't mind sacrificing themselves if it will satisfy a group's need or risk life and limb on a novel discovery. Boggarts are driven by a primal urge to explore and experience. They scour the lands for new sensations, they yearn for constant stimulation, and they wish to share it with their brethren. In fact, a Boggart that doesn't share their experiences, known as a hoarder, is ostracized from their community. Boggarts are organized into semi-familial hovels and breeding grounds called warrens. Most warrens employ a matriarchal hierarchy in which a wise elder, known as an auntie, guides the community, passes down fables and important stories, and settles outstanding disputes. Such tales we hear in the flavor text of Boggart Forager. Reach in this hole, lose a hand. Reach in that hole, find a sparkly. And in Boggart Loggers, Auntie Flint lent axes to Nib and Yik, thinking they'd share their experiences with her. She's still waiting for them to come back. Boggart exploration is ruinous for other races. They often destroy Kithkin farmlands, steal from marrows, or pull pranks on giants, all in the name of novelty. When Lorwyn's sun falls and Shadowmoor's endless night rises, the Boggarts become less mischievous and more malicious. Rather than curiosity, Shadowmoor's Boggarts are driven by insatiable hunger. They feed on everything, both organic and inorganic, and organize themselves into marauding bands known as gangs to plunder. This we hear in the flavor text of Bloodmark Mentor. Boggarts divide the world into two categories, things you can eat and things you have to chase down and pummel before you can eat. The Boggart urge to feed is symbolized in their embrace of green mana at the cost of black, though they still retain red's impulsivity. Other races of goblins emerge in Shadowmoor's gloom that were absent on Lorwyn. Hobgoblins are a mix of intelligence and impropriety. They dress in clothes, they own land and raise crop, but are viciously aggressive. They are aligned with red and white mana. The redcaps, meanwhile, retain a black alignment. They are murderers and assassins. A green-aligned boggard race of forest dwellers, known as Spriggans, can alter their body and grow to enormous size in search of food. Lorwyn's giants tower above all, and their footfalls shake the earth. Massive and ancient, they are a race of wanderers forever seeking the plane's secrets and horizons. Though giants are mortal, they live so long and on such a grand scale that many small folk don't believe they ever truly die. Giants stand above the bickering of other races and offer an unbiased perspective. They are sought as intermediaries to end feuds, which we see in cards like Feud Killer's Verdict and Sunrise Sovereign. Giants are simple folk, at times generous with their large hearts, at times stirred to anger which is unleashed to much devastation. They share a connection to both red and white mana. Smaller races fear the giant's wrath and so treat them with deference. Only Lorwyn's sentient trees are older than the giants. It's as if they are a force of nature a part of Lorwyn that must be endured as floods or earthquakes. Disasters they often cause. We hear this in the words of the Kithkin Gaddock Teague. What does a mountain fear of a fly? Giants are barely aware of us, let alone afraid. Most giants are territorial and make their lairs in mountain caverns, but some soar through the clouds atop massive winged goats. As Lorwyn sets into Shadowmoor, the giants lose their friendliness, their diplomacy, and their cunning. They become barbaric, single-minded, 
and oblivious to all around them. Their destructive and primal urges take hold. Fortunately, they seldom stir from the deep slumber that takes them over. Shadowmoor's giants can sleep for months or years. They become part of the landscape as moss and rock grow atop their hides. We see this in Deep Slumber Titan and the flavor text of Marsh Drinker Giant. When giants rise from their long slumbers, they rarely remember how fragile the waking world can be. Shadowmoor's giants have lost their connection to white mana and instead drawn green mana savagery. A giant-like creature that slinks only in Shadowmoor is the Tro, the plains race of trolls. Trows are the vile trolls that lurk in the bogs of Shadowmoor. They reappear each night to frighten the living and gnaw the dead. Trows are rapacious, their hunger drives them toward villages, and they hunt other evils. Lorwyn's great forest is ancient and primordial. Few races know what transpires within its shadowed boughs. At its heart exists a dense grove permeated by magic known as the Murmuring Bosk, the birthplace and meeting ground of the plains tree folk. This race gained sentience long before the first elves, kithkin, or even giants roamed the plain, and their lives are measured in centuries. Born from seeds and saplings as any other tree, a mystical process called the rising grants self-awareness, mobility, and higher thought to the tree folk. In their youth, they remain within the bosque to learn from their elders before setting off to explore the plains' vast groves and gather knowledge for themselves. We hear in the flavor text of Orchard Warden that after the rising, a tree folk's mind is as limber and green as its limbs and is at its most receptive to our teachings. As extensions of nature, tree folk are connected to green mana, but they also share in black and white which depends on the species of tree from which they are born. Poplars are black-aligned shamans who siphon pain from others but themselves grow bitter, while ancient oaks share in the indomitable and philosophical nature of white manna. Tree folk are gardeners and caretakers. They watch over their forests as they would their own children, and they rarely cause harm to other races. In fact, some grow very protective of kithkin clackens, built on the fringes of the great forest, seen in the art of Guardian of Cloverdell, whose text reads, Although they're protective of all creatures, many tree folk are especially fond of the empathic kithkin. The relationship with elves is more complex. Both revere nature, but the druids and shamans of the fair folk use their magic to control tree folk whom they send to quell flamekin rebellion. Most races know the treasures held within tree folk minds and seek their wisdom. Often, they are met with riddles and enigmas only the most patient can unravel. Shadowmoor twists the great forest into a gnarled and withered copse filled with horrors known as the Creekwood. The tree folk likewise assume grim visages, their bark becomes petrified, their countenance becomes cruel. They seek vengeance against other races that have destroyed the natural landscape. Grudges are held until repaid, which we hear in the flavor text of Crab Apple Cohort. Seven wives made seven pies from seven apples, each plucked from its branches. Now bare and bitter, it comes to exact its price. One apple, one bone. The most ubiquitous and least understood of Lorwyn's races are the thousands of fairies that flutter across open fields. These sprites have short, fleeting lives which inculcates an appreciation for the present as they seek constant distraction through mischief. Fairies are petty, gathering and sharing gossip, and also quite vain. In fact, the apt term click is used to describe bands of fairies, usually three to six in number, that travel together to sow mayhem. Fairy powers are derived from illusion magic known as glamours. Through these spells of slight, they lure other races, capture them in trances, or fool pursuers. Their selfishness, thievery, and reality-bending skill give them strong connections to both black and blue mana. Una, Queen of the Fae, is both ruler and progenitor of all fairy kind. 
never seen, rarely spoken of, she is believed by most to be purely mythical. The same goes for her realm of Glen Alendra, a sentiment heard in the flavor text of its sentinels. Some say the Valley of Glen Alendra is mythical, and that rumors of its existence are nothing but a fairy prank. Others say it is the Fae's most fiercely guarded secret. The Vale is home and birthplace of Lorwyn's Fae. Interesting correlations can be drawn between fairies and the insects of our world. Wrapped in beautiful flowers, the budding and fertile Una spawns winged, barbed, and insect-like fairies. These short-lived pranksters then buzz across Lorwyn gathering the dream stuff of other races as bugs gather pollen. Laden with glowing dreams, they return to their queen, who uses the pollen to create more offspring. The flavor text of Violet Paul tells us that a fairy is the offspring of Una and Mischief. We see them harvest the thoughts and dreams of others in cards like Thieving Sprite and Dream Spoiler Witches. Una, as mentioned, is responsible for the Aurora's span and its transformative magic. She uses her power to retain her own memories as Lorwyn shifts to Shadowmoor, and her offspring are left largely unaffected by its magic. This we hear in the flavor text of Fairy Swarm. Untouched by the Aurora, Una's fairies greeted the night like any other day. They continued to prowl Shadowmoor's haunts, gathering the now dark dreams of its inhabitants for their queen, and they still guard the mystic valley of Glenalendra with their lives. Finally, we come to Lorwyn's proudest and most noble of races, the Elves. The Elves are the de facto rulers of the plane, if such a position can be claimed. They combine shamanic mastery with martial prowess. Lorwyn's pastoral landscape gives power to the green, nature-revering Elves, but they differ from other plains Elves in many respects. First, they have a ruthless air. They are aristocratic and prejudiced against anything they view as beneath them. This shades their disposition with black mana. They also sport horns and hooves of various lengths, work alongside the forest's wolves, or ride atop majestic servant. The elves are paragons of elegance and obsessed with beauty, both in their society and in the greater world. In fact, the laws of beauty organize their culture into a stratified hierarchy where the most beautiful wield true power. The flavor text of Elvish Promenade gives us a succinct view. The faultless and immaculate castes form the lower tiers of Elvish society, with the exquisite caste above them. At the pinnacle is the perfect, a consummate blend of aristocrat and predator. Exquisites are high-ranking dignitaries and courtiers, but also number among the military elite as pack and hunt masters. Perfects rule over all other elves. They steer their cities, their word is final and they can kill lower-ranking elves with impunity. We see them beautifully illustrated in Imperious Perfect, whose text reads, In a culture of beauty, the most beautiful are worshipped as gods. Elves are also divided geographically into tribes that ceaselessly patrol borders. The most prominent is the Giltleaf, who reside within the impressive Dawn's Light Palace, deep inside the Giltleaf Wood. The Salana are also a strong tribe of roaming hunters who frequent Wren's Run inside the Great Forest. Elves busy themselves cultivating beauty, a vocation they execute ruthlessly. They view non-elf races and bizarre species as disgusting stains on an otherwise pristine tapestry. The name elves reserve for such vile abominations is Eye Blight, and they lead hunts to cull them from the land. All eye blights, but especially boggarts and the destructive flamekin, are tracked and killed with extreme prejudice by elves known as winnowers. Winnowers live to eliminate eye blights, creatures the elves deem too ugly to exist. We see their unparalleled skill in Hunter of Eye Blights and hear their conviction in the flavor text of Eye Blights Ending. Those without beauty are Lorwyn's greatest tumor. The winnowers have an unpleasant duty, but a necessary one. Elves undergo nearly no physical changes as the aurora passes over Lorwyn, 
but perhaps the most spiritual transformation in the gloom of Shadowmoor. Rather than actively seeking ugliness and excising it to create beauty, Shadowmoor's elves concern themselves with locating and preserving rare beauty wherever it's found, stealing it away from relentless evil. We hear this in the flavor text of Rune Servant Rider. Things of beauty are in constant peril. The riders whisk them to safety ahead of the encroaching darkness. This change in philosophy sees the elves lose their connection to black mana and instead adopt white mana's purity. Elvish society is centered around safe holds, bastions of hope in the bleak, and overseen by safe rites. Safe holds spring around fonts of beauty and are fiercely protected. The Gilt Leaf tribe has become the Wilt Leaf, but remains the most powerful group of elves. Two other races run wild across Lorwyn, though do not organize themselves in any meaningful way. The first are the ever present elementals, manifestations of the plane's wild and fairy tale essence. Elementals are given form in the primal beyond and embody powerful emotions, thoughts, or ideals. They're ethereal and fleeting, symbolized in the evoke mechanic. Elementals appear in a flash spark strong emotion or reverence, then disappear just as quickly. Many fables surround the elementals. Some are worshipped as gods, others are cursed as nature's vengeance. Lorwyn's also home to the chameleon shapeshifters known as changelings. Changelings are born in the mystical grotto of Velus Vel, a location very few know, and then journey into a land as strange as themselves. The nature of the changeling is impermanence. They can alter their size and shape to mimic nature, but they cannot themselves become it. This lack of identity leaves the changelings hollow and desirous of company. They often mimic other races to fit in. We hear this in cards like Shields of Velis Vel. Changelings can alter shape based on what the beings around them desire most. Lorwyn's changelings turn into venomous, tentacled mimics who care only for the hunt. The Aurora replace the changelings' innocence with malice, and their curiosity with hunger. Mimics wear crude disguises to lure prey. They then maul and devour the unsuspecting. A ten-card cycle of spirit avatars appear on Shadowmoor's dark horizon that are absent on Lorwyn. Inscrutable, their purpose is not understood. What is known of them is documented in the Seer's Parables, an ancient tome whose excerpts appear in the flavor text on their respective cards. Each avatar embodies the union of two colors of mana, and each is a powerful manifestation of the plane itself. The plane of Lorwyn Shadowmoor is an ever-shifting landscape of dual realities. The idyllic, sun-dappled lands of Lorwyn support creatures of fable who often work in tandem to reap the benefits of abundance. The scarred and dark gloom of Shadowmoor stains hearts, stirs fear, and burrs the ruthlessness that seeps into the very land. Following the events of the Phyrexian invasion, Lorwyn's future is uncertain, but so great was the threat that even staunch enemies became crucial allies in the plane's survival. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on the plane of Lorwyn Shadowmoor Explained. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on which reality you like better, which tribe captures your imagination, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon who make all of this possible and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash the Lorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.